Alhamdulillah, Salat Islam, Allah Rasulullah. Um, I am at the house of Muhammad Al Jabali, who has extended his uh, hospitality to me, and he has offered to give us some advice for our Majlis Ashura at Masjid Al Awal. Um, and this is a good thing so that we can open up our ears for the advice and the knowledge from an, uh, a known Islamic organization such as Al Quran was from the society. Um, and Brother uh, Muhammad Jabali is the Ra'is, the Amir uh, of this group. So the first question I have for the brother is uh, the status of wall hangings, such as a Quran or a carpet uh, in the masjid or in other places. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Amma ba'd. Uh, for this question we have uh, given some answers in some of the Islamic uh, publications like Huda but uh, for those who did not have access to that I can uh, summarize such discussions by, by saying that uh, hanging the Quran the Quran was not made as a piece of decoration so it is absolutely prohibited to use it for decoration and anyone who does it for that purpose is committing a great sin. So those people who uh, write the Quran in a way uh, that looks like a swan or a uh, or some kind of animal or uh, in the shape of a masjid where it, you can hardly read the ayat, they are uh, written in a riddleish form uh, just for uh, to make people feel amazed at the way the handwriting can be done. But so this is playing with the ayat of Allah, with the book of Allah, and this is prohibited. Uh, if the ayat of the Quran are written, or the hadith of the Prophet if they are written in a way that it can be read and understood, then in that case, uh, the uh, the the strongest opinion of the ulama is that they are still. Uh, and the least you can say about them is that uh, this is makru, which means it is something that is disliked in Islam. Uh, except, especially, let me go back, especially when the ayat are hung for such a long time and uh, they are so common to people that they don't even read them. They just become like a piece of furniture, like any other piece of furniture then again it is not permissible uh, to hang them. Uh, and this was stated by the great scholars like Sheikh Hamad Al-Thaymeen when he was asked about hanging Quran like what they do in Kaaba, on Kaaba where they ha- hang ayat of the Quran in gold letters and so on. All of this is, he says, it is wrong. Uh, however, if hanging the ayat or the hadith is for a useful benefit uh, for a benefit, for a definite benefit, like a person will read it and remember something, learn something from it, then that's the only case, or for teaching purposes, that's the only per- case when it becomes permissible. Uh, that would be the situation where, where that uh, we have seen in some uh, masajid and some musallayat, where, for example, uh, the brothers will write an ayah or a hadith on the, on the bulletin board or on the board, on the whiteboard, and then the next week they will change it, put another hadith or something like that. This is useful because they are not putting this hadith or this ayah for decoration, for learning, so people remember this meaning and then the following week they will change it with another meaning. So uh, to, do, to do a permanent hanging of the ayat, this is, to, to say the least, is my crew. Uh, if you want to hang them, hang them in a... Uh, uh, for a temporary period of time and then replace them with some other ayat so that people will keep remembering new ones uh, and not get used to this as a piece of decoration. When the ayat are hung uh, in the masjid or in a house, in any place, they should not be hung uh, in the front, in the qibla direction, because when you hang things in the direction of the qibla, you are distracting people from their prayer. Uh, some of the ignorant people, instead of uh, looking at the floor may look at the ayat and read them and this is wrong at the time of prayer to go and read the ayat of the Quran hanging or the whatever is hanging uh, on the uh, on the walls uh, 
some people hang the ayat of the Quran for barakah for uh, the blessing of them or as a protection they think that they protect them protect their masjid or protect their uh, houses and this is haram to uh, to do such a thing because the Quran the barakah and the blessing of the Quran is in following it is in abiding by it not in using it as an uh, as a talisman that you hang it in your chest or on your walls and this applies very directly to the uh, full text of the Quran that is sold in some bookstores where you see the full Quran uh, printed in uh, very tiny letters uh, that you cannot read unless you bring a microscope with you uh, or a magnifying glass and they hang it in the, on the walls thinking that they are doing something good by this there is no good in this because why are we hanging it? for whom to read it? for the ants for example or people with uh, very powerful eyesight. This is this is not something that a Muslim would do. Muslims would take the Quran, read it, understand it, and abide by it, applying in, the, in, in their lives, applying it in their lives. Okay. Uh-huh. And what about um, decorations in general in the masjid? Um, aside from the Quran, anything that you would add to the masjid that you would think, inshallah, this makes it more beautiful for the worshippers to come and see. You know, as far as I know, this would be should avoid these kind of things. Is that correct? Uh, well, this is one of the signs of the doom's hour, as the Prophet sallallahu indicated, that once you start, he was addressing Muslims, saying that when you start uh, decorating your masajid and uh, beautifying your masahif, your Quran books, then fadamaru alaykum. This is. Uh, the uh, the time when you will be destroyed so this is something that is not a good uh, sign for Muslims to do as the Prophet ﷺ was definitely warning about doing such a things and there are other ahadith which uh, carry the same meaning that the masajid are not meant to be they are meant to be places of worship which, which are made plain and the simple for people not to be distracted from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, once a person starts decorating uh, the Quran by you know as we see unfortunately now in some of the uh, Quran books that you get from the Middle East and other countries you find that they are so beautiful golden colors uh, uh, very expensive covers they put them in very expensive boxes of gold or silver or uh, other materials all of this is one uh, of the signs of the uh, dooms hour and it is it uh, gives uh, or announces the fact that Muslims are in a state of destruction now so this has to be avoided likewise for the masajid to be decorated it is a sign as I said of the uh, of destruction for Muslims and it distracts Muslims from what they came for to the, when they go to the masjid some people come to the masjid they want to feel uh, to, to have a, uh, a an extravagant to see an extravagant uh, extravagant atmosphere like what they are used to in their home in their homes or what they uh, wish to see in their homes some people like the zina the extravagance and decoration of this worldly life and this is not what the masajid has been built for the masajid has been built for uh, to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worship him without any external distractions so to put decorations as they do unfortunately in some of the many of the Muslim countries and this has started as Islam started declining people's masajid started becoming more and more decorated in the Ottoman uh, times in the uh, uh, or the previous times until our times you find that the masajid in many Muslim countries are decorated in a very extravagant way you go to a masjid as if you are going to a museum uh, you have all the uh, these uh, uh, the, these uh, decorated uh, uh, very uh, nicely handicrafted uh, members that uh, with, with different colors of curtains and so on for the imam to mount on to 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 go up and give the khutbah or you find the mahrab uh, with various colors of uh, little uh, uh, artistic stone 
that uh, very bright, you know, that people are so much dazzled with uh, by looking at it and with with the writings of the Quran and other things and the names of Allah and Muhammad and Ali and Osman, Ali, uh, uh, Omar, Abu Bakr, etc. They have all these uh, names around the masjid and the ayat of the Quran all around the masjid. So uh, you go to a masjid and you start eating an ayah and it's, it revolves all around the masjid. So you start, you have to make a full circle with your head in order to read the complete ayah. All of, all of this is not of Islam. This is not the way of the Prophet Wasallam. He never taught uh, such a things to be done or practiced even though if there was any good in it he would have uh, told people to do it they were capable of doing at least uh, so, uh, uh, some uh, of this decoration if, if it needed to be done but he never did it so this is a sign of decline of Muslims and as I said it distracts Muslims from their prayer the Prophet Wasallam once came to his, ha- to his house to pray and uh, there was a uh, curtain that Aisha radiallahu anha hanged, bought and hanged for him to please him and uh, he started the prayer and he found that he noticed after starting, after commencing the prayer that this uh, curtain was, had so much nukush, nukush means you know like prints decorations, decorated excuse me, decorated prints in it and he said immediately uh, he uh, immediately after the prayer he or I, I, I can't right now recall he probably even interrupted his prayer and he said take it away because فَإِنَّ نُقُوشَهُ تَعْرُضُ لِي فِي صَلَاتِي it's nukush, it's prints are coming to me in my prayer are interrupting my prayer so the people who say that that's okay, we can have a carpet which is decorated, we can have a carpet that we hang on the wall which is decorated or some other kind of decorations, a picture of a masjid or something Uh, they think that by that they are doing good they don't realize that they are harming themselves and harming others and therefore they are incurring sins on themselves and others by doing such a thing and they claim sometimes, and I've heard it from some people, you say this will distract you from, from your prayer. Uh, like the prayer rites that are common for people uh, to use. Uh, I say this, you're not supposed to use this. This distracts you in your prayer. It has so much uh, uh, prints uh, p- and pictures that you are sure to, uh, to drift away from the prayer once you start looking at them. And, uh, and they will say, no, they do not distract me. And I tell them that if this is true, then you are either one of two persons. Either you, are, you have better concentration in your prayer than the Prophet ﷺ, uh, or uh, you have a problem in your concentration. You, 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 you do not have at all any concentration or understanding what you are praying. And everything that is distracting you is much more than this things that this thing becomes like a minor distraction for you and either one of the two uh, cases would be a problem for, for such a person so definitely anything that can distract the person from his prayer has to be removed the masajid, the prayer rites and the masajid should all be removed any colors uh, other than the prophet's floor in the masjid was, what was it? did he have carpets in his masjid? No, he did not have carpet. He used to pray on the uh, on the ground, on the ground. And when it rained, he used to uh, his forehead would be covered with with clay, with uh, tin. So uh, with mud, sorry, tin. Uh, so so he did not have it, and that is the easiest way and the most uh, uh, the most uh, uh, confirmed way to to be away from the decoration of this life to have your floor uh, of the color that of the soil in which we will be to which from which we were created and to which we will be will 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 return uh, so that's why uh, people like the uh, great scholar 
uh, Muhammad Nasruddin uh, Albani when he was asked about somebody was asking him I want I have a place that I designated in my house for prayer and I want to put a rug in it what color rug you advise me to have and he said a, ra a rug which is the color of the ground because this is the color that will have the least distraction for you because it is similar to the ground that on which the Prophet ﷺ prayed any other color, red colors, bright red colors, uh, yellow uh, even if they have no decoration then they have some distraction so how about when they start putting the decorations and the uh, you know all these frames, arabesque and other frames that cause more distraction and then they put more pictures and, and stuff all of this is a distraction from prayer and it has to be avoided by all means so, um, any attempt, any attempt to justify it uh, by saying that it's for those who are weak in their concentration is invalid due to what you said about the Prophet Sallallahu that he was distracted by it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, if the Prophet Sallallahu was distracted, who is the person who cannot be distracted by anything because uh, he is, uh, you know, he sees things that we do not see. So he sees the angels, he sees the jinn, he sees. He knows about Al-Ghayb uh, in a first-hand manner and yet he said these are coming to me in my prayer they are trying to distract me in my prayer mm -hmm. so how about people who are lesser than him like ourselves so definitely we we cannot have such an excuse we are not better than the Prophet mm -hmm. okay. um, so this brings us to if what we've said about the decorations and things which they should be avoided um, this brings us to the idea of is there a necessity obviously not but is there a necessity for a rug specifically for the imam if the rug underneath the rug that the imam wants is sufficient if there is like a plain rug for the whole masjid is there any need whatsoever to put an additional rug whether it be decorated or just a different color is there any need for a rug for the imam uh we uh, again, I mean, this answer, uh, this question has been answered. We answered it in uh, in uh, Huda in an article not very long ago. Uh, however, the the summary of that, or to in fact to elaborate a little bit more to, uh, over what we said there, is that uh, first the pair rights are pieces of decoration I have uh, not seen any prayer rug which is plain uh, and therefore the prayer rugs should be avoided as much as possible uh, if you are in your home and you know that the ground is clean and you have no proof or uh, no uh, high likelihood that that floor or that ground where you are going to pray has been uh, covered by Najasa then there is no reason for you to, to put something on top of the floor or the ground or the carpet which people refer to and use it now uh, as prayer rugs. There is nothing which is specific for prayer called a prayer rug in the Sunnah. So a person as the Prophet ﷺ said, All of the earth of the earth has been made permissible for me uh, as a masjid, which means a place for sujood, prayer place, and tahur as a place to use for uh, ablution or for uh, tayammum. So, uh, and and whoever, wherever the prayer reaches you, then you have to pray. That's from another hadith. Uh, whenever the time of prayer comes, then pray. So there is nothing which uh, tells that before you pray you have to bring a rug, and this rug has to be a specific uh, rug that is designated for the prayer. There is nothing like this in the Sunnah. Uh, these prayer rugs, as I was saying earlier, so first of all, it is not from the Sunnah to have a specific prayer rug. Second, these prayer rugs are mostly decorated. They have lots of decoration in them, so they distract the person. And third, uh, they are, uh, they, they bring the person away from the ground. And if you have, if you have, if you, if you can pray on the ground directly, or on the floor, or if you have a carpet, a thin carpet in your house, and you can pray on it, then 
were I to add one more thing to separate you from the ground when the Prophet ﷺ said تَمَسَّحُ بِأُمِّكُمُ الْأَرْضِ فَإِنَّهَا بِكُمْ بَرَّةِ which means rub yourself against your mother uh, the ground because it is uh, good to you or something of this effect and uh, we bought this hadith in Huda also uh, the, the scholars give two interpretations to this hadith which are both correct first of all that you can use it for tayammum and the other that when you make sujood if you can make uh, your sujood in the ground that is the best we are not saying it is required like what the Shia say that you have to have the ground or some piece of clay uh, uh, blessed clay that they get from Karbala that you have to pray on this is not uh, true and this is not what we say but what we are saying it is preferable to stay as close to the ground as possible so why move yourself further away and you remember that the prayer when you make sujood you make it is a sign of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you have to be in the most submissive case when you are when you have a f- uh, when you put your forehead in the ground in the mud or in the clay this is a clear sign of submission but when you start putting layers on, on layers of uh, uh, of easy nice stuff to put your your forehead on and I have heard even some people ask or maybe even do it that they use a pillow to make sujood on it and they ask you is it is it not permissible is there anything against it in Islam uh, so they want their prayer to be very smooth, very nice. Doesn't have the feeling of submission to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They forget. They forget what the purpose of the prayer is. It is to 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 exhibit our extreme humbleness and submission and fear uh, from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And this is this has to be done in the proper way, including the uh, the the, uh, the actual formal way of doing it. Uh, uh, or the external way of doing it not only the submission of the heart uh, so for this reason also it is uh, one should not u- be using uh, or should be as much as possible avoiding to use prayer rugs and if you have a rug then there, what's ne- the need for another one then definitely you should not use it furthermore people uh, now introduce the bid'ah of having a special rug for the imam in the masajid and this is indeed a bid'ah because again uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not do it. He did not have something special for him to stand on uh, when he prayed with the Sahaba. This gives the Imam a, uh, a certain distinction that is not justified in the Sunnah. Uh, the Imam has to pray at the same level as the people behind him. If they are praying on a carpet, he should pray on a carpet. If they are praying on the ground, he should pray on the ground, and so on. Some people use the uh, the rug as a way of determining the direction of Qibla because in some masajid the masajid are not built in the correct direction of the Qibla so they use the rug of the Imam to tell what is which way is the correct direction that may be excusable to a certain degree uh, but if you can avoid this by using something else like drawing a uh, a simple a short arrow close to the front of the masjid just to tell people that this is the correct direction to pray to but that should do it but to, to make a, a specific rug and in some cases it is a fluffy big thick rug for the imam then this is against the sunnah it gives the imam a, a certain distinction that as I said is has no justification uh, in Islam and there are other problems that's why you know uh, uh, you know these are just a few of the problems of using prayer rugs in general and using, using them in the masjid in particular and using them for the Imam more specifically. So all of this has to be avoided as much as possible. Allahu um, So I want to get into a little bit about the sutra. Um, so what you've said about the prayer rugs, um, obviously they wouldn't qualify as being a sutra, meaning that if an, a person who is not knowledgeable enough about the sutra to know that it has to be an object or something in front of you, they might just use the logical idea that well, the people know I'm praying. This is the sutra is for the people, so they know I'm praying, instead of obe- you know obeying and uh, following the sunnah. Um, so, what what would you say about the, someone who would use one a rug as a sutra, thinking that this makes it clear to everyone that this is he's praying? Mm. 
Well, uh, we had a long article about Sutra in Huda, you can refer to it, and this is answered to a certain degree in the second, it was two parts article, and in the second part we discussed some of this idea, uh, that how, ma- how much space you need to leave for the person who, ad- who does not have a Sutra before you can pass in front of him. Uh, but to summarize here, I would say that the Sutra is required for the person. For a person who, has, who wants to pray uh, has to have a sutra, a sutra. And the sutra has to be, the Prophet ﷺ has described it in his sunnah, and that's in that article also that I'm referring to. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ described it, and its length is about uh, a foot and a half or 50 centimeters. It should be to that height. And some of the scholars have permitted, based on some various evidence, have permitted the length or the height to be uh, slightly less if you do not find the uh, the proper height, uh, if it is not available. You look around and you cannot find it, so you use something of lower, like a cap uh, or a, a few books and set them in front of you so that people will not pass. But the hadith clearly say that it has to be مثل مؤخرة الرحل and this is explained there uh, which means uh, the the pole that you set on the uh, uh, on the saddle of the of the uh, camel it's, uh, it goes on the back of the saddle of the of the camel so as long as you have something like this in front of you then the prophet ﷺ says nothing will hurt you nothing that will pass beho- beyond that point will hurt you but if you do not have things might hurt you might hurt your prayer, might reduce your reward, uh, might even completely annul your prayer. So why? For, so for the person who does not take a sutra, he is definitely committing a sin if he just uses a rug and says, these are my limits, these are my dimensions, nobody can pass closer, let them pass beyond. If they pass beyond, uh, if a woman, for example, passes beyond, even though he has this uh, rug, then his prayer is uh, invalid. Uh, on the other hand, for the people who see a person praying, whether he has a rug or not, if he doesn't have a sutra, then they should leave for him the distance that he was supposed to leave for himself had he had a sutra. Because they want to abide by the command of the Prophet ﷺ who said that if one of you knew how much sin he is committing by passing uh, in front of the person who is praying, then he would rather have stayed, stood 40 40 something days or years or something it's not clear from the hadith, rather than pass in front of him. So because of this hadith, we would rather not not cross in front of him but for his, that doesn't mean that he is not committing a sin by, by not having a sutra, sutra. He is committing a sin and he must have a sutra and he is endangering his prayer. Well, as I said, this is uh, answered in detail in that article, so it, I would advise that it be read. And briefly, what what's the maximum distance that you should leave between you and your sutra, so that we can, if we see somebody praying without a sutra, we can use that and avoid that area? Uh, this is also explained uh, there. Uh, the uh, the distance from the person to his sutra should be uh, three arm lengths and the arm length is about 50 centimeters uh, so it is the distance from the tip of your fingers to your elbow okay so that's an arm length it's from the sajda. from the place of sujood to your to where you stand three arm lengths okay. so that's uh, one and a half meter or in feet it's about uh, uh, five feet or four and a half feet something like that so that's the distance you leave between your place where you are standing and the place of your sujood. Okay. Uh, and that's where you set your sutra. Uh, or, uh, uh, alternatively, it is the distance when you make your sujood, the distance between your head and the place of your sujood, uh, between the head and the sutra, should be the distance uh, of the passage of a small animal, which means about a foot or less. So the distance. Uh, the person who, who sets a sutra should not make it any farther or any uh, closer than this. He should try to abide by this 
length unless there are some reasons to push him to like the puzzle is very tight and the imam has to come very close to the wall then he is limited in his space and he, can, he has to come closer to the sutra but in general he should not pray too close to the sutra so that as some people do when they pray uh, their head hits against the wall or the sutra this is not the correct way of praying to the sutra and on the other hand one should not have it too far like some person prays about 10 feet away from the wall and he says the wall is my sutra because that way he is prepared. or even somebody prays in the back of the masjid and he says okay I have a sutra the front wall this is, uh, this is not right it is ridiculous in fact because he is not taking a sutra in this case and he is uh, prevent he is preventing those who are ignorant from passing anywhere because I've seen people they come into the masjid and they wait because they see somebody praying in the back of the masjid they stop there and they wait for him to finish his prayer because before they can cross even if they are very far toward the front of the masjid so by that he is also harming other people uh, indirectly whether he knows it or not um, from the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa uh, where should the adhan be called for the prayer? Okay, uh, this is uh, dealt with in a, uh, in a booklet by uh, Sheikh Al-Albani uh, called uh, about uh, uh, the answers to the questions from Al-Jami'ah It's a small booklet that I think it was available in our bookstore I'm not sure whether it's still or not But uh, it's in Arabic, it's, it, we did not translate it uh, The... Uh, the answer there, he was asked about the uh, Jum'ah in particular and where the Adhan is given and he said that the practice, of course we know that the Adhan, the practice of the Prophet ﷺ was to uh, send somebody to give the Adhan on top of the Masjid and we know that the Masjid at that time did not have a Mi'dana as later on the Masjid started to have this high tower or uh, minaret for the Mu'adhan to go up to it and give the Adhan and later on they replaced the Mu'adhan by loudspeakers and so on so there is there was no such thing what they used to do is go on the roof of the Masjid and give the Adhan so uh, it is uh, for example we know the, the Hadith about the Fajr prayer that uh, or the Fajr Adhan that the Prophet Sallallahu says let not the Adhan of Bilal stop you from eating or drinking because he gives his adhan when it is still night so continue to eat and drink until uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum gives his adhan and the Sahaba, the Sahabi who report the hadith uh, tells he says and there was not much time between these two adhans except as long as it would take for Bilal to come down and uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum to climb up so it's clear from this hadith that they both used to even though Ibn Umm Maktoum was a blind man still he had to climb up people of course would help him but he would climb up to the roof and give the adhan on top of the masjid of the Prophet because the adhan uh, is meant for people outside the masjid to hear it so that they will know that the time of prayer has come or the time for Suhoor has finished as in the case of the Bilal of, uh, the, the Bilal, Adhan of Bilal and Fajr so uh, so if it is uh, it is meant for people outside the people inside already of course they will hear some of it but it, it, they won't hear it as much as if the Adhan is being given inside the masjid itself because the, the person who is giving the Adhan he is supposed to be shouting very loudly for people to hear the adhan should be a very, given with a very loud voice and, and that is indeed a big uh, uh, disruption of the concentration and the prayer of the people if the adhan is given uh, in, the, in the midst of the masjid where people, many people are praying sunnah and doing some other things uh, of course there is the ibadah aspect of the adhan the adhan is not only a mere announcement because otherwise uh, we would have used a uh, buzz like the Christians use or some other means to indicate to people that the prayer time has come but in Islam we know and the hadith uh, is authentic on how the adhan was prescribed and that uh, two of the sahaba saw the same dream 
and the Prophet Sallallahu confirmed it for the Adhan and he loved it uh, he, uh, he was pleased with what they saw as contrary to what the Jews and the Christians do to announce their prayer time so uh, so the Adhan is not merely a way uh, something, uh, a, a means of announcing the time of the prayer it also in addition it carries the meaning of Ibadah in it because you say things that are a worship in themselves you say words that are a praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, a uh, declaration of our belief in him and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, uh, and, and we are supposed to respond to the adhan by certain things certain dhikr this all tells that the adhan is ibadah and, uh, and that's why uh, many scholars uh, are of the opinion and this is inshallah the, the correct opinion that even uh, if, if a person does not pray in the masjid uh, he's too far from the masjid or he missed the prayer in the masjid and he is praying by himself then he should still give the adhan uh, in this case he's not announcing the time of prayer to anybody even you know the time may probably have passed half an hour ago so now the announcement aspect of it is not there anymore but still the ibadah aspect of it which is uh, the words that are said to precede the prayer are there and this was declared in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ for the man who uh, did not pray correctly and he saw him and he told him three times you did not pray so go back and pray and the third time uh, in one of the authentic reports of this hadith he told him when you uh, want to pray then do this and this he told tells him how to make the wudu then uh, then أقن, then give the adhan then give the iqam so he told him even though he's an individual person to first give the adhan, then give the iqama, then start the prayer. So the person has to do it. So uh, then back to the question: uh, the adhan is normally given outside the masjid. And uh, as I was referring to the book of uh, Sheikh Nasser, he was explaining also that it is authentically reported that on Friday, when the Imam, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ went to the member when he was ready to uh, start the uh, the khutbah then the adhan is given outside the masjid on top of the door or the entrance to the masjid so that's where the adhan is given still outside so that's the sunnah uh, to give the adhan in the uh, outside instead of uh, uh, you know uh, as I said uh, interrupting the uh, thoughts or the uh, ibadah of, uh, of Muslims who are uh, praying inside or to limit to minimize this interruption uh, in addition to being the practice of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, this is if, if this is of course as long as it is permissible, because in some uh, countries, in some states, in some towns, it's not uh, permissible to give a loud adhan in the open. Sometimes the neighbors would go and report it, and the police would come and investigate and so on. But if it is permissible and possible, then and also if, if the weather permits it because sometimes if you if you go to open the door to give the adhan outside it will be too cold everybody will be cold because of that but as long as it is possible and it is not does not cause uh, too much problems to Muslims then it this should be uh, the better and uh, preferable approach to give the adhan outside the masjid if it is not possible then it, it would be given inside and in that case, like for the person who prays individually by himself, you lose the announcement aspect of it, except in as much as would you would tell the people inside the masjid that now it is the time for prayer. When you know they already actually have the clocks instead of them in front of them usually, and they can tell that the time of prayer has started. But just if somebody is not aware, to remind him that now the prayer time has started, so be ready for the iqama very soon. But it, is, it becomes mostly the ibadah aspect rather than the announcement aspect of the adhan. Um, and Brother Jad had mentioned about the adhan and calling it outside that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hear it uh, inside or outside. So it's not, it's not like if you call it inside, Allah doesn't hear your adhan or it's not accepted. But the idea that we don't believe that the angels and the jinn are like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all hearing. They may be outside the message and they may need to hear the adhan and this is this is the argument I think for the people who say using logic that the Muslims have moved away from the masjid there's no Muslims around the masjid so calling it outside of the masjid serves no purpose yeah 
Yeah, you are right. This is another another thing, another point to be added. Uh, there is a uh, there is an authentic hadith of the Prophet in which he says that uh, there is no uh, shepherd, uh, somebody who is tending the uh, cattle, uh, that would be in a badu or hadar, which means he is in the in the town uh, or in the badia outside with the uh, in the desert and like in the mountains or somewhere very far from the from town and the prayer time comes to him tahdur uh, salah and then he gives the adhan and he uh, prays but they will pray behind him of the creation of Allah those whose ma la yura tarafa which means those whose two ends will not be visible which means there will be such large huge numbers of creatures praying behind him that you cannot count them because of their uh, uh, numerosity so this hadith clearly indicates that there are angels and there are Muslim jinn there are creatures that Allah will grant to this person who announces the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the open uh, even though he is in the middle of the desert or in the mountains where he can, cannot see anybody he still would have uh, people to, to pray with him in jama'ah and he will get therefore he is granted by this the reward of the jama'ah from Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, similar to the uh, or reminds of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he tells about a person who says Salam and the people do not respond to his Salam then there are those who are better than them that will respond to his Salam so don't don't worry about if you say uh, if you say Assalamu Alaikum and the person feels like not to respond to your Salam he doesn't like you or something that doesn't matter because there are people uh, there are creation better than him who will answer you with Salam who are the angels if you say, uh, if you sneeze and say Alhamdulillah, and there's nobody around you to say Alhamdulillah, still say it because there will be angels who will answer you, and so on uh, so Allah Alam, that's the answer to um, also along with the idea of the Adhan um, many masajid, when they call the Adhan for Fajr, they incorporate the uh, idea of saying As-salatu khairu min an with just one Adhan, and this is the actual Adhan for Fajr uh, what's the sunnah regarding what to say in the event for Fajr? Uh, as you probably know, this this uh, is a controversial issue. Some scholars say that uh, because there were two adhans, the sunnah is to give two adhans. One of them at the time of the Fajr al the uh, uh, lying or the deceitful Fajr. That's how it is described in the Sunnah. Mm. And the other is that the truthful Fajr, when the real Fajr times comes. So since there are these two times for uh, uh, two Adhans given for Fajr, uh, then one of them is only the one in which as salatu Khairan Min al used to be said. And uh, this is, it is controversial. Some scholars say it is said in the second Adhan not in the first adhan and some say no it's said in the first adhan uh, and some say it's said in both uh, the, the correct opinion Allahu A'lam of all these uh, opinions is as is recorded by uh, As-Sama'ani in his book Surah Al-Salam is that Salat Khayr al should be said in the first adhan not in the second adhan and this makes sense because he brings his evidence, of course, there, and you can refer to the book. Uh, it makes sense because the first adhan is meant to wake up people. So you say, as salatu khayr al prayer is better than sleep. So that people will wake up, will get ready for, will eat if they, if they are going to fast, will have the chance to eat something, and then they will start getting ready for the prayer. The second adhan, people are supposedly awake already. So there is no need to tell them that prayer is better than uh, sleeping. Allahu
So as I said, I mean, this is controversial. Does this answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you if you are practicing the idea of just calling one of them, this is okay. If you call one adhan in that case, and the adhan is at the time after the, f- the true fajr has started, then there is no need to say a salat to khairun And when you um, with the imam, in many cases in the masajid in America, the imam uh, has his himself as a leader of the prayer, but we don't see that the imam comes five times a day. And so when the imam doesn't show up, there's no line of uh, like chain of who's next in line after the imam um, and this presents problems in terms of who's going to lead this a lot who do you listen to in terms of what you know if there's a problem that comes up who's the leadership for the uh, masjid so what is your advice regarding you know having an imam and there's no known second imam or no known next person in authority uh Okay, the beginning of your question is a little uh, confusing to me because you say that the Imam is the one who normally leads the prayer and I was wondering what else is supposed the Imam to be? The one uh, unrestrictedly in charge of the masjid. Okay, okay, because Imam is the leader. Uh, you know, the Arabic, uh, the uh, literal meaning of it is the one who leads the people. And since he is not the leader in the sense of the Amir Mu'minin or something like that, then he has to have a more limited imamship. And his imamship in this case is to lead the prayer. And maybe some other functions in the masjid to take care uh, of the affairs of the masjid, like perform marriage and divorce. And mm-hmm. but, but basically he is the one who is supposed to be leading the prayer. Uh, now, the Imam is supposed also to be the one who uh, has the best uh, memorization of the Qur'an. Uh, the, the, the one, now we are talking about, well, let's make a separation so that uh, there won't be a confusion here. There is a person in charge of the masjid. Let's not call him the Imam. The, let's call him the uh, uh, Ra'is of the masjid or the mudir of the masjid yeah the manager of the masjid let's call there is a person who is the manager of the masjid and there is the imam and let's call the imam the imam is the one who leads the prayer let's call the person who leads the prayer the imam in this time okay so that way uh, there is no confusion between the two the, these two positions could be the same and most masjid they are the same the Imam and the manager of the masjid are the same, one of the same person. Uh, but suppose that there is a person who is managing the masjid, managing the library, managing different things, or setting, deciding who will do this, who will do that, and then somebody else who is leading the prayer. Uh, then the person who leads the prayer should be the one who memorizes the Quran the best. This is because the Prophet ﷺ says, يَا أُمُّ الْقَوْمَ أَقْرَأُهُمْ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ the one who leads the people is the one who reads and reads here definitely means memorizes Quran better of all of them uh, if they are equal in uh, the mem- memorization of the Quran then the one who knows the Sunnah better, best if they are equal in the Sunnah then the one who is the first in the Hijrah if they are equal in the Hijrah then the one who is oldest of them so this is what it should be if the manager is the one who memorizes Quran the best then he is the one who leads the prayer if he is not, then the masjid is his uh, realm of uh, or domain of power. He is in charge of the masjid, right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Wala yaumman al-rajul al-rajul fi baytihi, wala fi sultani, wala yaqadan ala takrimati illa bi izni." Which means, let one not lead another person in his house or in his domain of power without his permission. And let him not sit on his preferred in his preferred place of his house without his permission. Well, this hadith tells that the uh, the highest uh, priority for leadership comes to the to the manager to, or to the person in charge uh, of the uh, of a place, whether it's his house or the masjid where he's in charge of or some something else. Uh, so the manager of the masjid is the one who has the first uh, priority to lead the prayer in the masjid. 
But if this manager is not the one who memorizes Quran the best, then if he wants to abide by the complete hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he may decide, and this is better, to give up leading the prayer to somebody who memorizes the Quran better, and let him lead the prayer in his place. Uh, in some cases this is not possible because sometimes the imam is hired to lead the prayer and he, if he doesn't uh, lead it the uh, people uh, who hired him like the board or whatever it is will consider that he's not fulfilling his uh, obligations but if it is possible then it is best for him to abide by the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So and even if it is uh, his domain of power but the Prophet ﷺ indicates that he can give permission yeah. Then let him give permission to the one who deserves most to lead the prayer, who is the one who memorizes Quran the best. Uh, if uh, now now the, uh, if the imam is not present, then uh, it is best to designate people. Like you say, uh, you see, you know, he knows the part, the brothers. Oh, before I continue this, I should say that sometimes the imam may find it. And uh, this should not, of course, follow personal reasons and inclinations, but follow shara inclinations. That the imam may find it that the person who memorizes the Quran the best is not, uh, it is not suitable to let him lead the prayer. Yeah. Because he may cause fitna or something among people, their division, some people do not want him and so on. Maybe his recitation is awful. No, if the recitation is awful, this is part of the memorization. So he he should not be allowed to lead. Like, if, even if he memorizes the whole Quran, but he doesn't read it correctly, then this doesn't help. It has to be memorized the way that it was read by the Prophet ﷺ and his Sahaba. But uh, what I'm saying is that, suppose he is the best reader of the Quran, yeah. but if he leads a prayer, people divide into two. Some people say we will not pray. Half of the people in the Masjid will not pray. Or he has problems. He has problems with his character. He is you know, known to be falsif or something. Uh, then uh, the manager uh, would be advised or he would decide probably for the benefit of Muslims not because he personally has something that he doesn't like for this yeah, person yeah. but for the maslaha yeah, yeah he, would, he, he might decide that he would not let this person lead the prayer okay. not even as the first choice or the tenth choice but this is, this is possible but what I'm saying is that in the ideal case the person who knows the Quran best would be leading the prayer. If he is not there, then the second one comes, the one who memorizes Quran second, and then the third, and so on. And uh, it would be better and easier for the uh, Imam, for the manager, sorry, to uh, uh, to make a list. That would be easier to reduce the fitna also. Like say, he would say that uh, I lead the prayer or such and such person is the prayer if he's not present or I'm not present then uh, this comes next if he's not present this comes next and then if, if these three not present then see whoever is uh, knows Quran best and let him lead you inshallah and ideally these would be people who are in the mess and most likely would be there if he's a man is not there yeah that's yeah because he wants to help people find a, p a person to lead the prayer in his absence and, and another thing that I want to point out is that suppose that the imam appointed, uh, the manager appointed somebody to be uh, the imam to lead the prayer at all times. Uh, that doesn't, uh, that's his general permission. He can uh, at, any, at any time for any reason, for example, in certain situations it may, it may be uh, uh, wise or uh, it, may it may be required that that person does not lead the prayer, but he himself, the manager, leads the prayer uh, for a certain specific reason that comes up. So, so that permission doesn't make it a granted forever uh, leadership of prayer for the for the imam. It's still the right, the upper right stays with the manager, with the person in charge of the place. That is. So, if I am in my house and I say to a brother, "You memorize Quran better than you," whenever you are in my house. Inshallah, he will lead the prayer. And then uh, one time, he came to my house, and there were some other people, for example, and I felt that some people maybe they dislike him, there's some hatred between them, and if he leads the prayer, they will think that I am supporting his position and so on. Then I, I can't come and tell him I'm going to lead the prayer now. 
and I go ahead and, and lead it. So I, that doesn't mean that I give him a permanent uh, permission to lead the prayer all the time. I still have the permission in my hand because by virtue of the hadith of the Prophet uh, From the authentic sunnah, uh, there are other qualifications uh, for the person leading the prayer, such as age or how long you it's been since you've made the hijra or these things. Um, but in respects to the Quran, these are less than the Quran, right? Than the knowledge of the Quran. The other qu- uh, qualifications come after, as the hadith, okay. uh, as clear from the hadith. He says, first, the one who knows the Quran the best. And some scholars, or uh, yeah, some scholars try to say that the one who who knows the Quran the best means who knows the Quran and its interpretation, which is in the Sunnah and so on. But this is refuted by the rest of the hadith, which says if they are equal in Quran, then the one who knows the Sunnah best. Okay. So, so. The first priority, suppose you have two persons. One person memorizes the, uh, 20 parts of the Quran, and the other person memorizes 18 parts of the Quran. The first person uh, knows uh, five, uh, 50 hadiths and their meaning or their implication, the Sunnah, you know, yes. the Sunnah from them. And the other person knows 500 hadiths. Then who has more right to lead the prayer? The first person yeah. who knows yeah. more Quran, yeah. even though it is only two juz, because of the now assuming that both of them read it as good as each other, mm-hmm. because sometimes uh, one of them will be uh, will will have will memorize ten juz, but he will be reading them correctly, and the other one will be memorize the whole Quran as I said earlier, mm-hmm. but he will read it in a very uh, wrong way. Yeah. So in that case, the one who reads less is actually the one who knows Quran better than the, uh, the the one who memorizes less knows the Quran better than the one who memorizes more because that he also knows the correct pronunciation and reading of the Quran okay. um, and the last uh, topic is about a majlis of shura and the, the way that the imam takes the advice uh, from the sunnah um, we find that many people have put themselves in leadership of the masjid but then they put an imam in leadership in the leadership of it but they give him the limited power or they say that he only he only answers to us um, the role of the majlis ashura from what I know is supposed to be one of advice and one of giving the, the shura you know um, what uh, what would you say about the people who uh, make themselves in their attempts to become like democratic make themselves part of just a voting body w- along with the imam that they have to vote on something to pass it with the imam and if the imam is outvoted then they take the majority vote mm. uh, a good deal of this uh, has been dealt with in a series of talks that I gave a few years ago two or three years ago uh, and the tapes are available under the title government and leadership in Islam so I talk in those tapes about uh, uh, mashura and uh, whether it is the mashura is uh, binding or non-binding on the uh, on the emir, on the leader. Mm-hmm. Now, in the case that you are describing, there is an imam, and the imam is not necessarily the leader or the ruler. Well, we are not talking about rulers here, here of mm-hmm. course. So we are not t- talking only about the leader of a group of people whether it's a masjid or a small jama'ah or something like that so and there is a board of shura a majlis of shura that gives him some advice some mashura uh, is the mashura binding on him or not this is a controversial issue I call, uh, uh, among the scholars some of them say it's binding some of them say it's non-binding uh, the we do not have to get uh, much into depth in this, uh, but uh, in, in the situation you are describing, to, to just answer what you are describing, uh, this is a matter of agreement. As the Prophet Sallallahu says, Al-Mu'minuna and the the believers should uh, adhere to their covenants or to their agreements. So there is an agreement between the Imam, uh, whoever is appointed as an Imam or a manager or a uh, person in charge of a uh, masjid, 
and then the others who are working with him or who are aboard with him supposed to advise him or consult with him and so on uh, this agreement has to be if it is if there's nothing in it to violate Islam that it has to be accepted so for example I, I am I, I am going on a trip with a group of people and they say that uh, they agree that they appoint me uh, to be the uh, the the Amir of the trip which means the person in charge the manager of this trip so along the way so what is the what is the Amir of the trip that means uh, if we uh, if we want to stop in a place if somebody wants to go to the bathroom or something then they will uh, tell me and then I will see what's the most suitable place to stop if you want to stop for prayer I see what's the best time to stop we want to eat which place to eat best which is the best place to eat want to sleep and so on all the things which are related to the travel to the trip now uh, suppose that I tell them uh, you have appointed me as the emir and I will command you or one of them to divorce your wife because I am now the emir I cannot do this because now the agreement is that he is the emir of the trip not the Amir, the Amir Mu'mineen, the Khalifa of Muslims, who can command me whatever he, he wants and then I have to obey him. It's not the same situation. So we cannot extend the, uh, the agreement beyond its, uh, its limits. And its limits in this case are known. The, uh, even though it is usually not written, it is something implicitly known between people what is the uh, Imara of travel, but it is a limited Imara. It doesn't have to do with uh, with marriage or with any other things beyond the travel. Or the Amir tells me today I don't want you uh, to wear uh, white socks. I want you to wear black socks, for example, or things like that. Which it doesn't have to do with it. This is not what I agree with him. I don't have to obey him with this. So we have to know the limit. If uh, if it is uh, and and also the agreement. Now some things could be. Uh, discussed if we find that the Amir could be uh, could behave in a way that we do, would not like during the trip we could discuss with him and agree with him on certain things before the trip started like we yeah. say you are the Amir but we are with you we are five people going with you and if you want to stop at a certain place to sleep yeah. first you have to consult with us and if you find that we are in general agreement with you there is no major opposition then you can stop there. If not, then we, we will continue. Or if they say that you're the leader, but we have to be back in three days. You can't make us stay for four days. Yeah, if you put conditions and he agrees to them, then you have to go, he has to go by them. Uh, if there are no conditions, then as long as it is a matter related to the travel, then he can make the decisions for you. Uh, and the agreements sometimes are implicit, as I said. Like you go with him on a trip, you say, uh, I'll go with you, but... Uh, you do not say what is the limit, what's, how, how long you can stay there. Mm -hmm. And then he decides that he likes the place and he wants to stay for a year. And you are going with him for one week. Yeah. And he says, you have to stay with me. Even though nothing was written or declared, but it's known that you are going on a short trip with him. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this has to be fulfilled. Otherwise, as I said, I mean, if the agreement, yeah. uh, if, if, if you have fear that some, uh, there is some ambiguity that may cause problems later, then it's better to write it down. Whatever is the uh, position, whether it is leader of uh, of a trip or leader in a masjid or leader uh, for a community or uh, jama'ah or whatever it is, you. Uh, so, so if there is an agreement between the board and the emir or the uh, the imam or the manager that his power is not uh, open, he has a limited power, then they have to abide by this agreement. If they agree that he has to take their mashura and it has to be, the, the majority of them have to agree on a certain thing before he can do it, then he has to abide by this. So it depends on what they agree, on what they write down, whether they write it in a constitution or in a uh, work document, working document or something like that. Well, so I ask, uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us uh, to return to the sunnah and may this effort benefit us. Uh, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward our brother uh, Muhammad al-Jabali for his effort and his uh, time, which is very uh, little that he has. Um, can I insert the phone number in case anybody has any questions?
for the Janet? Don't want to answer number or anything else? Yeah, you can give it. In short, okay. we, we do not answer it except if they leave a message usually. Okay, you want to put yeah. it on there? I don't know. It. It's 800 uh, Sunnah, I think. A- 800 uh, A-S-S-U-N-A-H. Okay. 800 Sunnah. Okay. Alhamdulillah, you Yeah, that's it. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.